Hello, everyone. Welcome to New Ways to Fight Old Dragons, Addressing Infections and Inflammation. Uh, I'm one of your moderators this evening, and I will be introducing the other speakers in just a moment. I uh, wanted to let you know the session is being recorded, so it will be available to all ResearchCon registrants after the event. Uh, so let me take a moment to introduce myself. Uh, I'm James Lawler. I'm 34 years old uh, with cystic fibrosis, and uh, I am a big fan of ResearchCon. Uh, it's my third ResearchCon, and I really love how it brings the entire CF community together to talk about research and science and CF, uh, especially as a researcher and scientist myself. It's really exciting. So uh, you will be seeing me a little bit later on in this session uh, where I'll be talking about uh, Dr. Jim Shamil uh, with inflammation. And before we get started, I wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items uh, about the technology and how we can all interact with each other. Uh, first of all, closed captioning is available and uh, should be showing up automatically on your screen. Uh, if it's not, you can turn them on or off uh, by clicking the closed captioning button on the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will be taking audience questions. We want uh, lots of questions and interaction. So please uh, send us your questions at any time uh, using the Q&A box. Uh, definitely use the Q&A box instead of chat because the Q&A box will let us see your questions and make sure that we answer them. Uh, we won't be able to answer questions about anyone's individual diagnoses or treatment plans, uh, but we encourage you to use the information that you learned today to have a conversation with your own care team about your situation. Uh, otherwise, we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can verbally. Uh, and we will also be answering questions directly uh, in the Q&A section. So check back there if we haven't uh, gotten to your question yet. And today helping us out uh, in the chat and in the Q&A, we have Dara Riva. Uh, who is the Director of Clinical Research and Words uh, at the CF Foundation. So thank you, Dara, for uh, helping us out, and also happy birthday to Dara. Uh, and now I will uh, let my uh, companion, Seth, introduce himself. Thanks, James. I'm Seth Gregory. I'm 38 years old and also have CF. Uh, today I'll be talking with you guys uh, about phage therapy with Dr. John Koff. And uh, you'll also notice the group chat for everyone who's in the session. Please note you'll want to change the chat drop down menu so that your messages go to all panelists and attendees. That way, everyone who is in the session can see your comments. If you have a question for the speakers, make sure you use the QA box to submit it, not the group chat. If you have any technology problems during the session, please return to the event homepage and click the live support chat icon in the bottom left of the web page to connect with tech and support program. I'm uh, Molly Pam and I'm 33 and also adult with CF. Um, I wanna take some time to introduce our presenters and talk about the format of our session. This session will have three independent mini talks, uh, each going in depth on different aspects of infections and inflammation. Uh, each of the three of us will be moderating one of the talks and hosting a Q&A immediately after that talk. So you won't need to remember your questions from talk to talk. I now want to introduce uh, Tiffany Burnett, the Senior Director of Biopharma at the CF Foundation. She is going to be telling us about the Infection Research Initiative and Drug Pipeline. I will be moderating her Q&A after her presentation. I'm now going to turn it over to Tiffany to get us started. Thank you, Emily. And Tiffany, if you could press the present mode. Sure, I'm just trying to get there. Yep. Perfect. Welcome, Tiffany. So thank you again, Emily. Thank you again, Molly, for the introduction. Um, 
it's a pleasure and an honor to, to kick off tonight's discussion. Again, I'm Tiffany Burnett, the Senior Director of our Biopharma Programs and ongoing research here at the foundation. And as part of my work, I oversee our industry portfolio related to infection and I co-lead the infection research initiative. Uh, this evening, I will go over the following uh, topics with you all. Um, I will talk about the progression of the IRI uh, portfolio. I will speak a little bit about our academic and clinical research. I will highlight our industry portfolio. I will talk a little bit about how we fund research here, and I will also highlight a bit about our AMR fight. I'm excited to um, share the great progress we've made from an IRI perspective. Um, our infection research initiative was kicked off in 2019 with the commitment to invest at least $100 million over five years to improve detection, diagnosis, treatment, and outcomes of CF-related infection. To date, the CF Foundation has funded over, over $85 million in new research across academia and industry. Um, we've increased our interactions with industry partners, bringing on seven new contracts in 2020, and um, we've almost doubled the number of funded academic proposals since 2018. We've also focused our research and we've tried to prioritize our research. So the foundation works very closely with our steering committee, which includes CF experts, opinion leaders, and community members to prioritize our six focus areas that you see around the microscope. Um, we've also tried to enhance our communications and our transparency by holding webinars. So in uh, last half of 2020, we had a webinar just specific to infection. Um, we've tried to increase our social media presence and we really worked on streamlining our communications because we do hear the community and we want to let you know that we hear you. So we're working really hard to communicate with you better. Now I'll talk a little bit about our research and our industry. Just to show a bit of metrics, um, we really have increased our funding, as I said. So you can see how our funding has netted out within academics and with um, industry. And to date, we have um, over $85 million in, in funded research. Um, academic is typically more focused on better understanding and characterizing infection, while our industry is really focused on developing specific treatments. There's obviously some overlap, but we really do try to um, harmonize as much as we can across by really prioritizing um, accordingly. As you can see here, from a research perspective, um, the initiative has strengthened our efforts to prioritize and align across both platforms. Our steering committee helps us prioritize our focus areas. Um, so you can see for 2020, we spent um, a good bit of time understanding CF microorganisms. And this is the category where most of our basic research is funded. Um, we also spent um, a bit of our efforts and our resources on detection and diagnosis. Um, this has become more and more challenging in the era of highly effective modulators, since sputum is not as easily collected by most CF patients. So we're really spending some time and effort on this. And in the future, you may see a survey that comes out because we want to hear from you and how um, that's going and when, you're, when you are able to produce sputum. So look out for that. In addition to that, we've also funded the Predict and Promise study in NTM. And that's also looking at um, diagnosis and how we ultimately treat the disease of NTM. And from a microorganism perspective, we've also started to really align and make sure that we are looking across um, industry and across academics in the same way. So here, what I'll highlight is that we did have some spending in 2020 um, in the viral space, and this was due to a COVID-19 RFA. Um, where we wanted to start learning more about how this potential um, virus could affect people with CF. And those fundings were um, really solidified at the beginning of this year, so that work is ongoing. And um, we've also turned our focus to fungal a bit, and we had a, our first fungal workshop kickoff in the first quarter of this year, 
and Dr. Gina Hong and Dr. Dave Nichols are, are leading those efforts. So there'll definitely be more to come on that. And we are still also are having a session um, on Saturday on fungal. So please check that out if you have an opportunity to. Um, and thirdly, we really are trying to focus more on um, research plans or research that cover multi-organisms. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to the infection portfolio. So moving right along, um, I wanted to highlight our infection portfolio and just share that we have 18 active programs currently in development. Um, and we're actively seeking opportunities in the fungal in the MRSA area. Um, I also just want to highlight that we've spent a lot of time trying to grow and diversify our portfolio from a strategic perspective. We've engaged with companies across all pathogens of interest for CF, and we're listening to community and we're following in the science. But drug development is complex and companies make scientific and business decisions regarding their portfolio and their programs. So we have to keep that in mind when we look at our portfolio and sometimes it may appear a bit fluid. You may see some programs um, when you look at our, at our website and other times you may not. So we have to keep that in mind that, you know, drug delivery companies and drug development companies make decisions for different reasons. Um, but I just wanna share what gets us excited when we look at our portfolio. Um, when we get projects in our portfolio that have different mechanisms of action, that's exciting because it has a potential to fight more strains and more resistant strains. It has a potential to hit a broader population of our patients and um, it has a potential to fight both gram and, and gram negative and gram positive pathogens. So that's really exciting for us. And Microbion and Contrafect are companies that are working in that space. Um, we also get excited about non-traditional um, antibiotic development as per the WHO definition. And John will spend some time talking about our phage programs. Um, and lastly, we, we really do get excited when folks come to us and they want to redesign approved drugs to offer potential added benefits to patients from either a safety or ease of use perspective. And just another view of our portfolio, um, just to show that we do also diversify, um, not just by modality and mechanism of action, but also by stage of development. So I'm gonna just cover very quickly um, how we fund research um, from a CF perspective. So we have two major funding mechanisms. One is from a grant perspective, the other is from an industry perspective. And um, you can go and check this out on our websites. The, hopefully Derek can put those into the chat if you're interested in doing research with us. But I also would invite you to go to the research resource landing page for full options of contact lists and also to see um, all the other types of research we, we support through the TDN and scientific consultation in our bio lab in Massachusetts. So I wanna just hit very quickly on the role of policy in the AMR fight. Um, policy surrounding antibiotic development is in flux. And I think all of us in this space can have an appreciation for that. The reimbursement reforms and a review of the life cycle process of antibiotics reform is also needed. But I'm happy to say that um, we are taking a leadership role here at the foundation. Um, we're one of the only patient groups that actually has a seat at the table in this fight. And we're also looking to partner globally and nationally um, with other partners who are looking to join into this fight. So more to come on that. And I wanna just round out this topic by just having a call of action for you all to go and check out our new policy and advocacy page and see how you can get more involved with, with um, the advocacy and policy efforts that we have fighting the good fight of disinfection here. So I wanna just wrap up by um, thanking all of the people who contribute to fighting this good fight of infection. Um, it really does take a, vill a village to fight these old dragons and I'm glad to be a part of this important fight. So thank you for your time and um, open it up for questions. Yeah, well, thank you, Tiffany. I mean, this is all such great information. I mean, infections is something that I personally am passionate about. 
uh, because I've been battling them the entire time I've known I've had CF. Um, so in 2018, particularly while I was being treated for NTM, I came down with a cold that of course turned into a full-blown exacerbation. Um, I was also, I was adding on medications to treat my MRSA, multiple strains of MDR pseudomonas and ABPA with prednisone all at the same time. So I was on six antibiotics at that time, uh, four of them IV. I ended up in the ER with a potassium and bone marrow shutdown. Uh, and I guess we found a limit on how many antibiotics I personally can be on. I know that's always something talked about in the CF community is how many is too many. Uh, and this research is just so important so that we can find these drugs to treat multiple infections and simplify the treatment burden and side effects for all of these drugs. Absolutely. So we are now gonna open it up to Q&A. Please again, put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, any questions you have about the pipeline policy, uh, anything about Tiffany's presentation that you want. Uh, I can start with one that we got pre-submitted. Uh, which is on your slide, talking about what research we fund, you, there's nothing in the phase three category. Uh, so can you explain why there's no phase three trials going on right now? Or it seems like it. Sure, so a, a couple of things. I think just to level set, traditionally the foundation really funds early stage development. So that would be phase one and two. Um, as you can see that our Savara program, which was our phase three program, um, it wasn't successful. So therefore we don't have much in that space. But you know, again, we typically do our funding in the earlier stages of development, but we are actively looking for products that are closer to the finish line, if you will. So that's part of my role to really interrogate different companies to see how um, much more quickly we can get those therapeutics to patients. So thank you for that question. Um, a follow-up question along those lines on that same slide is, can you explain why some of the trials were crossed out? Sure. So again, I, I wanted to just share again that drug development is complex. And sometimes that uh, we have a trial and it doesn't meet its clinical endpoint, and that's determined by our regulators. But what I can say is that with all those trials that are crossed out, we learned something from those, right? And we're now looking to either do another trial in that space or we're taking those learnings to make sure that the next trial that we do in that space um, has a better chance of success. Great, I think it's so important to keep track of all of that and really close the loop on a lot of those trials. Yeah, we're gonna, we do better. So I think you, if you check out our, our pipeline and our website, you can see additional information on some of those trials and you could also, you know, just feel free to reach out to either Dara Riva or myself, and you know we can share more information. Great. Uh, we've got a few questions about um, NTM um, on the MAC and Obsessus sides of things. And people wanna know like what new research has been done to prevent the return of a MAC infection after a culture conversion or to treat it long-term chronically? Well, as I mentioned, um, there are a couple of prospective studies um, that we're doing to really look at how we um, really detect and diagnose and then further treat NTM. So we know that's been a sticky space for, for some time. Um, I think another thing that we've done is we, we've really been concentrating on companies in that space. So you'll see that we had two new contracts this year in the NTM space. Um, and we continue to really look at that space and try to bring in the best experts to help us kind of determine what that overall best treatment is. Um, but we're, we're still a bit away from that. So more to come, but we're actively pursuing projects in that space. Great. Um, I've got a question now about pseudomonas. Uh, so what are we doing to combat antibiotic resistance, particularly with pseudomonas and also is it realistic that maintenance therapies like inhaled antibiotics could be used and successfully eradicate pseudomonas, uh, especially with modulators? Well, I'll take the first part of that question. 
um, in terms of what we're doing to really pursue pseudomonas. Um, as I mentioned, sometimes we have those multi-pathogen um, drugs and we also have new mechanism of action. So we're really you know, dedicated to that space. If you look at our research and the amount of um, resources and money we spend on that, we really you know, try to look at it as broadly as we can. So nope, we're not putting on the brakes in any areas, but we're really pursuing every um, avenue that we can from a pseudomonas perspective. Great, yeah, and it really shows with the portfolio too. And, and then this just the second part about what we're doing from a policy perspective. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time on that in my presentation, but we do have a very active policy and advocacy team here. And I do invite people to check out that website. And it shows that we're not only working on the scientific aspect, but we're working on the policy aspect because we all know that the policy also has to change in order for this to be viable for to, to just bring drug companies to this space. So um, Mary Dwight, who heads our advocacy and policy at the foundation, her team is excellent. And I, again, invite you to the website to check out more of what we're doing in that space from a policy perspective. Yeah, that's also important. I think we have time for one more question, one or two more questions. Um, so how has the community shaped the infections research initiative? The community is very involved in our infection research community uh, initiative, excuse me. We actually have um, members who sit on the, the steering committee. So they're involved in our uh, yearly strategic discussions. And um, again, we, we are actively listening to the community and, and just trying to provide more feedback to the community real time. But they're very much have a seat at the table and help us decide what our focus areas are for research moving forward. Great. And uh, last question that you can very briefly answer uh, is what happens to a drug or our knowledge about a drug when a company decides to stop development for business reasons, really? That's a great question. So um, in recent years, we've um, tried to put clauses in um, different language in our contracts with these companies that may give the CF some rights if the, the programs are stopped for reasons other than scientific merit. Yeah, it's so great that we can get some of that information. So thank you all for the questions and thank you, Tiffany, for a fantastic presentation. I will now bring uh, Seth back on video along with Dr. John Koff to discuss speech therapy. Thanks, Molly. Dr. Koff is an adult, is the adult CF program director at Yale. He will discuss the phage therapy and its potential. Great. Uh, can you see, see my screen and, and hear me? Wonderful. Thanks for the introduction. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I really appreciate uh, the CF Foundation inviting me and, and, and the organizers for putting this together. I get to talk to you about uh, bacteriophage or phage therapy in the next few minutes, and then uh, we'll have time to, to have uh, an opportunity to discuss any questions that come up. Uh, so off the bat, I do wanna let you know that um, uh, I'm uh, the primary investigator on a study we're calling Sci-Fi. Uh, that's a single center study done at Yale, which is funded by uh, our university and also by the CF Foundation, looking at inhaled phage therapy for individuals who have pseudomonas. And so that study is currently ongoing and obviously informs uh, my ideas uh, uh, in, in, in about uh, some of this discussion. In addition, uh, my colleagues at Yale have licensed this technology and started a company called Felix Biotechnology. I don't have any financial interest in the company, but I obviously talk with them about uh, my ideas for, for phage therapy. So the antibiotic resistance crisis is something you just heard about from Tiffany. And, and obviously I don't think it's new information for our community. Uh, you know, I think um, I've, I take care of patients. Uh, there, there are folks out there. We've already heard a story about um, individuals with CF having multidrug resistant infections and the complications associated with that treatment and the impact that treatment has and these infections have on uh, individuals with cystic fibrosis. So the first 
picture here is really just showing you the increased prevalence of pseudomonas and um, in blue, and then uh, um, unfortunately multi-drug resistance uh, pseudomonas that evolves. Uh, and, and that's a function of the antibiotics that we're using and the ability of a bug like pseudomonas to quickly develop resistance. And the issue here is, is something that Tiffany already highlighted, which is our discovery pipeline is not coming, uh, is not keeping up with the evolution of resistance um, in, uh, for this bacteria. And it's also going to be a global problem if it's already not recognized as such. Uh, and that's in the picture on the bottom here, um, if you can see my cursor, where the World Health Organization or WHO has uh, put together um, uh, a kind of a case study of this and is predicting by the year 2050, uh, this will be an international uh, pandemic uh, in the sense that uh, individuals will be uh, getting sick and unfortunately dying from antimicrobial resistance unless new interventions are um, established. And, and this is going to be just as impactful as common diseases uh, such as diabetes or cancer. And so that's where bacteriophages come in. Uh, these are viruses that infect and kill bacteria with quite a bit of specificity. They were first discovered in the early 1900s. And um, uh, with the advent of antibiotics, the Western countries in Europe and, and the United States uh, left, uh, left kind of research and, and the use of phage therapy uh, by kind of uh, uh, went away from that. But, but in Europe, specifically Eastern Europe, and then Russia, or, or what is now Russia, and some of the former Eastern, uh, you know, USSR, Eastern Bloc countries, there was a lot of work done on phage therapy. Uh, so there's a lot of information out there, um, but we need to inform that uh, as we move forward with, um, with more rigorous understanding of, of, of the implications. And so the starting point is for us to recognize that um, phages infect bacteria, but don't have a mechanism to directly get into a human cell. And there are tons of phages on the planet. It's, it's predicted to be 10 to the 31. So more phage on the planet than any other or, uh, living organism. And, and 10 phages for every one bacteria would suggest that we should be able to find a phage uh, out there that can, that can infect and potentially kill a bacteria of interest. And that sets up a paradigm for us where we can think about phage therapy being kind of personalized medicine in the sense that an individual that has cystic fibrosis has particular bacteria in their sputum, and we should be able to identify that bacteria and find relevant phages to kill, selectively kill that bacteria um, to potentially help uh, from a clinical perspective, excuse me. And so this picture here on the left is a um, electron microscopy of some of the phages that we use in the laboratory. And below it is this cell uh, cycle showing how a phage in this cartoon, uh, let's imagine it's infecting pseudomonas, uh, gets, uh, binds to a specific receptor, allows for genetic material to get into the bacteria. There's a replication process. And then one phage can lead to multiple um, phages that disrupt, break, or what we call lyse the bacterial cell. And this becomes a self-amplifying process so that one phage can lead to many others that can then continue the process and go and kill additional bacteria. So I'm really happy to say that there is, has been a real increase in the development and interest of phage therapy programs in the US. I'm aware of this group of programs. Uh, if I'm missing any, uh, I apologize. Uh, these are just the ones I've become informed about uh, as we've been developing our work. And what I'd like to do is focus on um, some of the, the aspects that, that we're developing at Yale to give you a sense of, of the possibilities that are out there. So this is a, has been a phenomenal collaboration for me with uh, Paul Turner and Ben Chan, who are uh, basic scientists in, at Yale, um, who really get a, a phenomenal credit for developing um, this work. This is actually a picture of Ben here in a local sewage uh, facility um, where uh, we're able to, he's collecting sample uh, because there's obviously a lot of bacteria. And from that sample, we isolate phages um, and so these are locally and environmentally sourced phages. They're not genetically manipulated. Uh, we identify uh, phages that uh, for our purposes today will target and kill pseudomonas. 
And then I'm going to talk to you in a minute about a novel strategy that Paul and Ben developed that I think is really, really exciting, uh, specifically for cystic fibrosis. And then we have examples where we've um, been able to obtain approval from the FDA and local IRB and institutional, these are institutional review boards to allow for us to, um, to uh, provide compassionate treatment of phage therapy for, for individuals with CF. And the, um, the development of this scientific program comes from a brilliant concept that Paul and Ben came up with and I think they're unique in this develop in developing this idea because their background is as uh, is in training as an evolutionary biologist uh, with expertise in bacteria and phage. And so the concept that they came up with is they recognize that a phage here, as you can see on the on this picture, can bind to a variety of targets on the outside of the pseudomonas, and we consider these receptors for the phage, as I showed you before, to get in uh, to, to bind to and, and get into a bacteria and, and replicate. And if you imagine the idea where you recognize that bacteria and phages have been fighting and, and evolving together, and so the bacteria are programmed and Pseudomonas does this really well with, with the antibiotics that we try and use, but it's also doing it with phage. They're trying to figure out ways to survive in the presence of phage. And so they have to have mechanisms to, to defend themselves. And what Paul and Ben recognized is if you take advantage of that mechanism, we could potentially have a beneficial effect uh, when we think about um, uh, treating and, and, and a beneficial effect for, for the individual. And so the mechanism here that they came up with is in this picture, this is a, a receptor that's on the surface of the bacteria. It's called an efflux pump. And the efflux pump um, is used by Pseudomonas to push out antibiotics that get into the cell. And so if, if the phage then targets that receptor, it's obviously gonna kill um, uh, bacteria and Pseudomonas by, by getting in that way. But the Pseudomonas in the community are gonna wanna survive. And so what they do is they actually downregulate this receptor. So I've changed the color to it. So it's not there anymore. And now that phage can't bind to the bacteria. But the end result is if the efflux pump is gone, then there's no mechanism for the bacteria to push out these antibiotics. So the antimicrobial resistance goes down. And if you target a receptor that's associated with inflammation, then the same thing will happen where you downregulate this receptor and there's decreased inflammation. So surviving pseudomonas, those that aren't killed by the phage, are also going to be less inflammatory, and they're going to be they're going to have less antimicrobial resistance, which is, becomes a win for us from a therapeutic perspective. So um, I'm uh, using this picture with uh, permission from a, a, a newspaper uh, publication. This is one of our uh, phage therapy cases where we're we're having an individual with cystic fibrosis nebulize. Uh, um, the therapy in our outpatient clinic. And we've also done the same thing in the hospital. We typically nebulize for seven to 10 days and we're taking a look at a variety of metrics uh, downstream. And the data has been really positive so far in the sense that if we look at samples before we give phage therapy and compare them to samples after phage therapy, we see that in the presence of phage in the red, after, sorry, after treatment with the phage, so we're collecting samples a week after we finish phage therapy, we see that the bacterial titers have gone down significantly. So that's really exciting. Uh, this is on a log scale, so it's a, a bit, quite a big difference here in terms of the quantities of bacteria. That's also associated with a surprising increase in lung function. Uh, and while this isn't uh, a, a huge difference, it was really, a, it's really exciting to see that in individuals who had F, uh, lung function above 30% predicted, we saw an increased improvement in lung function, um, which uh, gives us uh, optimism that maybe this is a group that, that will respond. And then the trade-offs that I talked about in terms of antimicrobial resistance and inflammation also were shown to, to, to happen. So when we look at the bacteria that are surviving after the phage therapy in red, they were more sensitive to uh, classes of antibiotics uh, here, aminoglycosides and beta-lactams. So I think uh, um, you're, a lot of folks are familiar with tobramycin and, and an antibiotic like, um, like Zosin, uh, which would now be predicted to work in these patients when before the phage uh, therapy, that was not the case. And um, the other thing we looked at is this dye called piacinin that's produced by Pseudomonas. 
and targeting a different receptor, we were able to decrease the dye. And so you can see here it's gone. And what's interesting about that is in addition to being a green dye, uh, pyocyanin also causes damage to the lung. Uh, so there's less inflammation occurring in these uh, pseudomonas that have survived. So what we're doing is going through this, this really exciting process to uh, provide compassionate use uh, um, for, for individuals with cystic fibrosis and others that have a, a, a non CF uh, bronchiectasis. Um, and so we are identifying the, um, the bacteria in the lung. We're able to find a phage that works. We propagate and purify this phage so it it's, can be used. Uh, uh, this involves a lot of analysis so that we're clearly understanding what phage we're working with. We get approval, like I mentioned, from the FDA, and we look at where is the best institution to, to treat the patient and get approval from that institution. And each of the programs that are out there are dealing with the cost of this whole structure differently. Um, but this has been the platform that we've used that has allowed for us to then develop a clinical trial. I think important things for everyone to understand about phage therapy is that we still need to do the hard work to understand the best timing for, for treatment. Should this be done um, after antibiotics, uh, during an exacerbation, could we use phage therapy as a, as a long-term alternating therapy, similar to what we do with some of the inhaled antibiotics? We favor a nebulized delivery, but there are groups out there that are using IV with uh, uh, evidence of success. Um, we know that phage resistance will occur. And so we've obviously, I'm highlighting for you a strategy that we've developed that will take advantage of that resistance. So when the bacteria becomes resistant to the phage we're using, we actually get uh, uh, that trade-off that we're looking for. Uh, and that can be, that can have important effects and in, in, um, in terms of inflammation and antimicrobial resistance that I discussed. There's a lot of discussion about the use of cocktails versus single phage. We favor a single phage for long-term treatment because we think we may be able to use one phage that targets one receptor at a period of time and then repeat that a month later and then a month later um, in an alternating fashion where a cocktail that is really uh, using multiple phages, presumably targeting multiple different receptors might be more effective in the setting of an exacerbation. And then safety has to be done. And I'm happy to say that with the ongoing studies that Armada is doing through the uh, multi-center uh, study through the TDN with CF Foundation support and our study, we're really uh, um, making a, 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 uh, an emphasis in monitoring the appropriate safety metrics that need to be done because we can't trust some of the literature that we're reading from from, um, you know, that's in Russian and we're, we're not sure about some of that data. So this is something that's really important that I think I'm very happy to be part of and that we're accomplishing with these, with these current studies. And I think most important is um, we recognize that we need to keep looking for new phages that target multidrug resistant bacteria. So Dr. Hatful is an expert on um, non-tuberculous uh, non mycobacteria, uh, in particular Mycobacterium abscessus, and has uh, um, done some work providing phages that can uh, potentially target and kill abscessus and, and has um, uh, published uh, some really important cases uh, showing that effect. We have just uh, identified and are working with um, uh, phages that target and kill MRSA. We have some experience with a chromobacter, but the, uh, on the list are stenotrophomonas, um, and everyone's got a challenge with uh, finding a good number of phages that are effective against Burkholderia, and the list goes on. And I think most importantly is also, uh, as we have a better understanding for phage therapy, can we treat indiv an individual with multiple phages that target different bacteria without messing up the lung microenvironment uh, and the lung microbiome. So uh, I'm really happy for the support uh, that the CF Foundation has provided for phase trials. You can see here, Armada is uh, in a phase one study and we're a, a late phase one, early phase two study. Um, and so this, uh, it, it, they're, they're up and running at this time. And so that's really exciting. In addition, the foundation has put in a, a significant amount of resources as you saw recently into phage therapy. And I was told that in, in 2020, there were eight awards uh, related to, specifically related to phage research that were funded for, for a significant amount of money uh, that's, that's going to help us develop the basic science that's needed. 
And so before I finish, I wanna thank all of the patients and their families that have been, um, uh, that we've been able to work with. The phage program at Yale, uh, spearheaded by uh, Ben Chan and Paul Turner and our colleagues. Uh, the folks in my lab have been fantastic. I, I have the privilege of working with a great adult CF program. And Marie Egan is the director of our CF uh, center and is uh, uh, just an outstanding colleague to work with. Uh, so I wanna thank everybody. And at this point, I can take questions. Thanks, John. After this last year, it sure is nice to hear about viruses that aren't trying to kill you, but are actually trying to help you. Uh, as someone with multi-drug resistant pseudomonas, phages are something I've really been interested in and keeping track of for a few years. I'm glad that they're looking into it so much in the US. Uh, these targeted killers really are amazing. I'm excited for the research and progress being made. Hopefully, I'll be part of a phage therapy trial at the end of the year. And uh, now we've got some more Q&A if you guys would like to submit some. Uh, here's one that was pre-submitted. It says, regarding phage therapy, is it possible for phage to damage healthy tissue? Can the phage cause a different bacterial infection, and how are they expelled after they die? Oh, so yeah, those are really, really important questions. And so the first, uh, I believe, was about whether or not the phage can target kind of hum human cells. And there's no evidence that the phage can directly get into a human cell, but there is the potential for human cells as they sample the environment, which cells do, to grab onto fluid that may have the phage in it. And I'm, um, I'm uh, happy to say that, that uh, I'm uh, collaborating with colleagues who are investigating that to make sure that there's not any unexpected potential risk. Um, however, it's very clear that we're not seeing direct infection of phages, which obviously are viruses into human tissue. Uh, so I think we'll have more answers for that. Um, in terms of the second question, uh, do you mind reminding me the, sorry, the second part of that? Uh, basically, how are they expelled after oh. they die? Yeah, so after, so if phage don't have um, bacteria to infect and kill, then um, they don't have a host and they actually just break apart. Uh, and so again, one thing for us to make sure we understand is if we add a lot of phages to the CF lung, then uh, maybe if these phage break apart, they could also have some consequences and that's uh, being studied. I think it's important to recognize that the CF lung has a lot of different bacterial, bacteria and bacterial communities. So there are already a lot of phages in the CF lung. So an additive response by us giving one specific phage is probably not a big concern, but that's the safety uh, that needs to be um, uh, evaluated very carefully in these studies. And the third part there, sorry, on that compound question. Uh, but can you use it to target antibiotic, uh, kill bacteria that are already, that aren't sensitive to antibiotics that a lot of people are resistant to? Or they yeah, so that's a great question. And so that is the strategy for, for us to target some of these multidrug resistant bacteria. And that has been the success that we have had for some individuals with pseudomonas where we find phage, for example, that works against uh, what is considered a multidrug resistant pseudomonas. So that, that is a great opportunity for us to use phage. And, um, and I think uh, that's something that's gonna continue to be explored uh, and, and is one of the principles for us to consider phage therapy here. Is there much research going into uh, the difference of chronic use of phages versus acute? It's a great question. So right now the studies are really identifying the safety of, uh, of a short-term administration of, of phage. But I think once we have that experience under our belt and we understand that the safety aspects, the, the next step will be whether or not we're going to think about using phage at the time of an exacerbation or using phage as a chronic therapy similar to alternating antibiotics where you could envision maybe uh, receiving phage at the beginning of the month and then potentially a couple weeks later or the next month uh, depending on, on how durable the effect is. I'm very interested in that second strategy and, and that's the one that we are uh, really uh, thinking about pursuing, especially for, uh, for cystic fibrosis. That sounds great. Can you speak about the phase two trials that you referenced in the slides? If, they, um, if they're gonna be, um, 
Well, I, I could talk about that that trial because uh, yeah, so that more about the phase three trial that's going on and which which bugs are targeting. Yes. So 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 we're currently um, uh, doing the the sci-fi trial, which is uh, it's a kind of one B two A phase two A kind of study, and it's targeting pseudomonas. Uh, in individuals that have FEV ones uh, uh, above forty percent predicted, uh, that are that have stable disease with pseudomonas that doesn't have to be multi drug resistant, and we're testing the potential effect of phage therapy to decrease bacterial titers as the primary endpoint. Uh, make sure that we're um, evaluating for safety as a primary endpoint, and then secondary endpoints will be whether or not there's a change in clinical status, decreasing exacerbations, or potentially a change in lung function in response to, to this therapy, as well as a lot of other kind of microbiologic. And I think someone had asked a question related to whether or not we have to worry about um, um, phage therapy for, for pseudomonas leading to other bugs coming into the space. And so far, our data is suggesting that that is not happening. So we don't see, for example, a ton of staff coming because we have been able to kill some pseudomonas. But these studies will also very carefully evaluate that uh, uh, in the sputum of individuals with cystic fibrosis. Oh, that's great. I'm glad that they're looking at all these options. That's all the questions, all the time we have for Q&A. So uh, now we're going to leave it with Jim and Jane to come up and talk about all right, so uh, I am back to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Uh, Jim Schmiel, and he is um, one of the pulmonary division chiefs at uh, the University of uh, Indiana and a uh, longtime CF doctor. So uh, take it away. Great. Thanks, James, and uh, thank you for... Uh, for me, this is my first uh, research con. Uh, here are some of my disclosures. Um, the objectives for the talk today are really going to focus on inflammation and anti-inflammatory research, and then what's the impact of modulators on the airway inflammatory response. Uh, I know that this topic is um, not uh, secondhand knowledge or firsthand knowledge to everybody, so I think it's important to have start with a few terms. Uh, macrophages, these are cells that are in the airway. They're scavengers so that when you breathe in particles or bacteria, they keep, uh, they, they gobble them up to keep the airways um, uh, from be becoming inflamed uh, as best they can. Uh, the neutrophils X are made in the bone marrow and they're kind of the first responders. They show up at a site of infection and they either ingest uh, bacteria or they release they open up and release their contents to try to kill the microbes. You also hear uh, BAL or bronchial alveolar lavage fluid. Um, this is lung fluid obtained from a bronchoscopy. And then uh, a biomarker, and this is just a biological marker. It's a molecule that uh, can be measured and is an indicator of normal uh, body processes or abnormal body processes or a response uh, to treatment. So this is a, a cascade of uh, the pathophysiology uh, of CF. We start with a gene defect. We go to the abnormal RNA, uh, which leads to the defective protein, which gives you abnormal surface fluid or abnormal environment, and ultimately uh, goes into the vicious cycle of obstruction, infection, inflammation, these processes uh, uh, feed out off each other and uh, can uh, cause a lot of damage. And eventually what happens is the airway itself uh, gets damaged. And so there's been a lot of research on, on CF um, and I could talk all day about it, but you wouldn't want to listen to it. So uh, I'll just make some key summary statements. Uh, the inflammatory response uh, starts very early in life. Um, it plays a key role in lung damage. And the neutrophils are the end product. So any, any anti-inflammatory therapy is going to have to ultimately impact the neutrophil or its products, either directly or indirectly. There were a lot of data from uh, the early 90s and new millennium demonstrating that the 
uh, inflammatory response is out of proportion compared to the bacteria. And, uh, and uh, there's also studies showing that even in young children, when you eradicate the bacteria, the inflammatory response uh, maintains. And there's uh, research being done to look at the association with uh, the basic uh, defect, the CF, abnormal CFTR protein. And this top panel where it says uh, non-CF, this is from a baby who was having a bronchoscopy for noisy breathing, uh, was not not infected. And it really shows what a uh, normal bowel fluid looks like. These purple cells that you see in this top panel, somehow I lost my cursor, um, uh, are called macrophages. Those are the cells that kind of hang out to clean things up that you get, that uh, you breathe in. Um, and uh, this is what we typically see. This is from a, a baby at six months of age with cystic fibrosis. This child was having um, a G2 place uh, for difficulty gaining weight. And we thought, well, let's take advantage of the um, sedation and we'll do a bronchoscopy for cultures. Interestingly, we did not grow any bacteria, but this child had a lot of inflammation. These are the neutrophils. These neutrophils, they, you can't really see the outline of the cell, but all these kind of tiny, these are what we call segmented nuclei. Um, and then also the macrophages, look at how activated they are. They're bigger, they got these vacuoles. Here's another one. And these neutrophils come in there and uh, they cause damage to the airway wall. And here is a slide that uh, shows the central role the neutrophil plays in CF inflammation. And you can see that there's a lot of things that call the, that call the neutrophil into the lung. And there's a lot of things that the neutrophil does that if it's um, present in excess can be harmful to the um, individual. And really what I wanna call your attention to is a molecule called elastase. And elastase is essentially an enzyme that um, breaks down protein. And the neutrophil releases this in the hope that it finds bacteria, but there's so many neutrophils and there's so much elastase that if they don't find bacterial protein, it actually breaks down the airway wall architecture. And it's actually this process that damages the, the lung and uh, causes what you may have heard of as bronchiectasis bronchiectasis or the, um, the end stage damage to the lung. It's actually not the bacteria. The bacteria are the stimulus that cause the neutrophils in and then neutrophils uh, kind of open up their cargo hold and that's what actually damages the breathing tubes. So this slide represents three days of my life um, and I get a lot of uh, good natured teasing from my friends like Jen Taylor Couser because when I, I wrote the caption for this, it said a simplified view of inflammation in cystic fibrosis airways. And you can see it's far from simplified. Um, and this is one of the problems we have to um, uh, deal with is where do we attack? What are the best targets? And if you remove one area, are you to address one area? Is it enough to address um, and make an impact um, you know, on the inflammatory response as a whole? So this is what's made inflammation so difficult that you can see the neutrophils coming out of the blood vessels, they crawl into the airway, but you got macrophages up here and all these other cells and you're producing mucus. And so this is why, what makes inflammation um, very difficult. And I think after my talk, James will be circulating a test on this figure for all the attendees. So what's, what's the data on anti-inflammatory therapy and, and CF? And uh, there were early studies of uh, prednisone back in the 80s a, that actually showed some beneficial effect um, on lung function. Um, the problem was is that Patients had, uh, at the end of the trial, had a lot of steroid side effects, uh, diabetes, uh, bone fractures, uh, cataracts. And so the steroids just never um, were able to be initiated. Uh, there was a trial by my colleagues in, in Cleveland, Mike Constant, and I show you this not to necessarily talk about a high dose ibuprofen, but to highlight where anti-inflammatory therapy started and where it's leading to. 
And so what you notice is this study was done in 1988 to the early like 1993. Pe uh, people were in the study for four years and it took 85 people in this study in order to do this trial. And they had to be in it for four years. And, and if you look at what the lung function, the FEV1, here's the placebo group in blue, that patients lost three and a half points in their FEV1 every year, not three and a half percent, but three and a half points. So if you were 97 one year, on average, it would be 93.5 the next, and the next year, 90. And so that's a lot of lung function to lose every year. And, but in the ibuprofen group, you see that there's a, a decrease. It went down to two. Um, and that's if people were in the study arm. If they actually took the drug, um, uh, you know, as it was prescribed, it was even better. And it was most effective in the children um, because the, the adults at age 39 uh, probably had a lot of um, inflammation. The reason I want to point this out is that when this trial was initiated, there were no cystic fibrosis specific therapies. There was no Pomazine, there was no Toby, there was, we had enzymes, we had vitamins and we used antibiotics, but nothing specifically approved for CF. And so we were able to use the lung function as a measure of how well um, these drugs uh, worked. And if you see that if you, change the FEV1, change the rate of decline. Um, so this is the uh, patients in the study who are followed afterwards. This is the placebo group. And if you look at the treated group, um, it's much better. They had an, almost a 90% slowing in the lung function decline. And this was maintained and, and uh, those patients that are, are still followed and they, it's still maintained. And so slowing the decline in lung function is, is, is very important. The question is, is how well are we gonna be able to track this in the, in the future with all the new therapies coming on board and how will they impact it? Um, in 2018, uh, they, follow, uh, they uh, uh, published a follow-up study. Couple of things to notice, here's the lung function decline. This is from the, actually the CF Foundation registry. The, here's, uh, these are all patients in the registry who didn't take the white, um, white bar on the right who didn't take ibuprofen and look at already with new CF therapies, the lung function decline uh, uh, went down to uh, 1.7. So it was halved already by 2018 um, compared to 3.5 in the late 80s and early 90s. And you still see there's a benefit of, of ibuprofen. It's down to about 1.1. But the lung function decline isn't isn't, the, uh, isn't as aggressive as it was. And that's good for patients as far as research studies, as, as that lung function decline gets less and less, you need more and more people to study them in clinical trials. And then you get to the point, can you do enough, get enough people in the trial for a long enough um, period? And rem in this 2018, this is before highly effective modulators, right? There wasn't trikafta, wasn't approved. And, and this is, and most of the patients in this, because it wasn't just in 2018, it was the years before, weren't on modulators. So now modulators has, has decreased this even more, which is a good thing. Um, this is a slide showing that ibuprofen use, um, it uh, started out about 20% tw uh, of patients who qualified, uh, received it and um, now it's less than 3% um, of the patients who are eligible uh, receive the ibuprofen. And so what that tells us is ibuprofen hasn't been adopted widely uh, in the CF community. And there, the reasons for that are you have to draw blood every couple of years um, and do what we call kinetic studies because everybody's body processes the drug differently. Um, and there are concerns over side effects so now this still tells us we're going to need a new anti-inflammatory um, to replace ibuprofen. The question often comes up, well, if we got modulators, do we still need anti-inflammatories? Because aren't they out modulators? If they work high in that pathway, aren't they going to make an impact? And the answer is, we think they do make an impact but we still think there's inflammation going on. And so this is a, called the GOAL study. So this is looking at um, 
Iva Kafter in patients with G551D, which is essentially a highly effective modulator. And what you see is that patients had decreases in their bacteria counts who, um, uh, after taking Avicaftor, and these are just, just six different inflammatory markers. And what you see, there was no impact. Even though the bacteria decreased, the inflammation stayed high or you know, it went up in some patients or stayed the same. Now there's a follow-up study that's being done uh, right now looking at um, uh, Alexacaftor, Tezacaftor, and Ivacaftor uh, in, in, uh, called the PROMISE study. And we'll see what that shows, but I suspect it's gonna be very similar to this. This is more supportive data on why anti-inflammatories uh, will likely be needed for the future. And this is looking again at the Ivacaftor patients. This was published by Greg Sawicki out of Boston. And what you see here are patients who were not taking Ivacaftor. They had a F508 um, DEL as one of their mutations. And so they were not any modulator and you can see their lung functions worse. Ivacaftor, Ivacaftor improve that in the G551D patients. But if you notice, this line doesn't go straight across. There's still a slight slope here going down. So again, this tells us that the inflammation is continuing, maybe not the same vigorous level, but it's still continuing at a slower uh, burn and it's still causing damage to the airways. So um, I'm gonna go over a couple clinical trials, but some summary statements about inflammation is it's exaggerated in CF and it causes much of the illness uh, associated with CF. Right now, ibuprofen is the only recommended anti-inflammatory drug for children, but less than 5% of people uh, are, who are eligible receive it. Um, I haven't uh, presented the clinical, all the clinical trials that have been done, uh, but the early clinical trials haven't found new compounds. We believe that the modulators likely have an impact on the inflammatory response, but the novel anti-inflammatory drugs are still going to be needed until we actually get a one-time um, cure. And then also, what about the people with well-established disease um, or the 10% of the people who won't receive, uh, won't have a modulator um, uh, for a while? So we're still going to need symptomatic uh, therapies like anti-inflammatory drugs and um, research into airway inflammation and anti-inflammatory drug development and CF must continue. I can tell you I've had several conversations with individuals at the foundation and they are, are committed to advance, advancing these uh, therapies like anti-inflammatory therapies um, uh, so that all patients can have um, improved quality of life. I'm quickly gonna go over two um, studies. This is a study of Asbilostat, and it was, the outcome for this was FEV1, um, and they enrolled 200 people for a whole year, and, and they didn't see a change in FEV1, and, and this is likely, is the drug not effective, or is it not enough patients um, in the, it, it, the, enrolled in the study, or not for a long enough period of time? Interestingly, the, the treated patients uh, uh, that received the study drug had a longer period of time without having exacerbations compared to the placebo patients. The, the, the problem is, is because this drug didn't meet its endpoint of change in FEV1, it is no longer being pursued and, and the company has, has folded. And this is a, a problem with some of these small biotech firms um, and it's hard to sustain some of these therapies. And when it misses its endpoint, um, investors uh, lose faith. So Jim, we are uh, getting close on time. So if you can wrap up. Uh, yep. uh, we'll get it done. And, and, and we'll some questions. Yep. Uh, so uh, this is a recent study in Lanabasum, another anti-inflammatory drug that didn't show an effect. This time we use pulmonary exacerbations. And what you see is there was no difference between the treated group and the placebo group. Uh, when we look close, here's one of the problems with using exacerbations is uh, different countries treat exacerbations differently. Um, and some of the Eastern European countries didn't have as many exacerbations. So right now when the FDA um, approves drugs, they use two outcome measures are the primary ones. 
lung function changes and exacerbations. But the question is, are these still practical in the highly effective modulator therapy? And so um, I'll, on this slide, I'll just point to bullet point three, the CF Foundation's working with the FDA. I think there's a meeting coming up soon to change their definition of what constitutes a clinically important change in out, uh, of an outcome measure. This is the pipeline for anti-inflammatory therapy. So we've got three in the pipeline, but there's many more in preclinical studies. So not all is lost. There'll be drugs coming on um, and new trials coming up in the future. And so what can you do to help? Well, you can participate in these clinical trials because we're not gonna be able to find a new drug um, if we don't have people in the clinical trials. And that's my last slide. That's great. Thank you, Jim, for uh, sharing that with us. I think it's really interesting to uh, think about the anti-inflammatory therapy because, you know, infections uh, take a lot of our, our time and attention. I mean, you know, they're what damages your lungs, lands you in the hospital, but I think the inflammation aspect is such a day-to-day -day impact on uh, uh, how we feel and how well we function with CF. Uh, so one question that's come in uh, before our session was, are there uh, any links that we know of between uh, the inflammatory response and how diet affects that in CF? Or is that something we're still looking at? Uh, I'm sorry, the links between inflammation and what? And, uh, and people's diet, so especially in oh, yeah. <laughs> usual uh, dietary recommendations in CF. So I, I will tell you, it's really hard because the inflammatory response is so complex. There were a lot of studies. There's been a lot of small studies looking at different, um, uh, different supplements or vitamins, um, and they may look good in the laboratory, but translating in the clinical trial, it just hasn't uh, seen an effect. Uh, several years ago, Preston Campbell asked me to do a study of broccoli sprouts in uh, because there's an antioxidant called sulforaphane, and it, it was a brief study. And the and first of all, you had to eat 100 grams of sulforaphane twice a day, and from broccoli sprouts, which is a huge plate, which you know obviously you couldn't do long term. It, it didn't work, but part of the problem is subsequently later, Asim Ziadi described a block in that pathway that is why the sulforaphane didn't work. So, um, in the the inflammatory response in CF is so vigorous. Um, the amount of supplements or dietary changes, I don't think most people would find it a palatable. In fact, nine out of 10 of the healthy volunteers complained about stomach upset. Um, one of the, only one of 10 people with CF, which tells me actually that people with CF probably deal with uh, stomach upset on a daily basis more than uh, people who don't have CF. Um, uh, but it, it's a lot, it was a lot of broccoli sprouts. So it sounds like that runs into the same uh, kind of challenge that we've seen in some of the clinical trials, which is that you either have to study it for such a long time uh, to be able to see uh, those really subtle effects. So it sounds like some of that uh, research and new ways to look into um, how we actually measure inflammation and if an anti-inflammatory is having a useful effect will be um, important for really our whole understanding. Um, and one last uh, kind of question I think that is something that um, I've wondered about and it's a little similar to a, a question that Nora was asking uh, in our Q&A uh, which is can you tell us a little bit about some of the, the current anti-inflammatory options, especially for people that can't take uh, NSAIDs like ibuprofen? Because I was wondering about that because I saw um, between CF patients in different centers, a whole lot of variation. And like you said, whether people use prednisone or whether they use um, you know, asthma drugs uh, to modify inflammation. And it seems to help some people and not others. Yeah, so that's, that's a, well, you just answered the question, actually, James. So thanks. <laughs> um, I, I, you, you, you know, you, that's a discussion you need to have with your uh, physician. Um, you, you know, prednisone or systemic steroids have a lot of side effects. Even inhaled steroids have a lot of side effects. The clinical trials of inhaled steroids didn't 
have it didn't show uh, any beneficial effect. Um, but again, for an individual patient who maybe has an asthma component, it might help that person. And so, you, you know, you talk about in general, um, but, you know, when it comes to the individual, that's a personal discussion with your, your physician. I would caution people, please do not just start taking high doses of an anti-inflammatory because you think it might work uh, because it could have a lot of uh, side effects. And it actually, you know, like vitamin E or vitamin C, if you start taking mega doses and, they, and in addition, they may interact with your other drugs. And so I, I would caution people from uh, just starting something without talking to your provider because I worry about drug-drug interactions. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I think that is all of the time that we have for uh, questions. So thank you very much for that presentation, Jim. And um, so that will wrap us up for today. Uh, Seth, you can come back on for our closing too if you want. Uh, so thank you to everybody uh, who participated and asked questions. Uh, I want to remind you, uh, we only got to talk briefly about fungal infections. Uh, but if you look for our fungal uh, round table uh, called Say It Ain't Mold on Saturday at 4 p.m. Eastern, we'll have uh, more about that. And I've got some of your questions uh, from today for that session too. And uh, Seth, if you'll tell us a little bit about Community Voice, that can wrap us up. Yeah, I want to call out the role of Community Voice uh, and how it's played in prioritizing the research of CFF focuses on. When you sign up for Community Voice, you'll receive surveys and opportunities to help with prioritization and have the opportunity to apply to be on the Infections Research Initiative Committee. It turns over every two years so that every two years you can apply. Uh, to join Community Voice, text CF Voice to 96387.